evening. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Dana. I'm an adult services librarian here at the Troy Public Library, and we're very excited about our program this evening, Dark Skies, A History of the Stars, with our presenter, Robin Portin. Uh, just a few things before we get started. I would like to thank the Friends of the Library for generously funding this program. Um, also, uh, after Robin's presentation, we'll do a little Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, you can wait till the end um, and you can ask them in the Q&A or in the chat, either one's fine. Um, also, there's going to be a link to a very brief survey at the end of the program. So if you could please fill that out, we much appreciate it. It helps with future planning. So again, thanks for joining us um, and I'll let Robin take over. Hi, everybody. Um, give me a minute and our second here, I'm going to share my screen. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the history of the night sky and why it is important that we preserve it. The night sky has been an inspiration for stories and legends. It has played a key role in navigation and exploration, and it has helped define cultures and civilizations. A lot of the art, music, and poetry that we treasure today was inspired by the night sky. But first, a little bit about your presenter. I always start with, hello, I'm Robin and I'm scared of the dark. It's true, I jump at every sound. I see every fleeting shadow while I'm out at night, but I can't miss out on that overwhelming feeling of wonderment when I look up at the night sky. One of the best birthday presents I got from my husband last year was a night vision monocular so I can see what is stalking me. It usually calms me down to see that it was just a raccoon or a deer enjoying their time out at night. I am the chapter lead from Dark Sky, Michigan, the first official chapter of the International Dark Sky Association in Michigan. Our purpose is to bring all of the dark sky conservation projects in the state together, and there are a lot of them. I've also been a delegate to the International Dark Sky Association for three years and co-founder of Women in Astrophotography. My passion for the night skies led me down this path to help create awareness that we're losing our view and our heritage due to artificial light at night. So being outside at night can be magical. It can bring an awe that stirs something deep in the soul. Until recently, our ancestors had a night sky brimming with stars, a night sky that inspired science, religion, philosophy, art, and literature, including some of Shakespeare's most famous sonnets. Nowadays, it's harder to find a view of the night sky that shows the true depth of the universe you would have to be on the International Space Station to see what is actually out there. And I'm going to give a disclaimer for those of you that have already studied the history of the night sky. There are too many stories, legends, and maps in human history to cover in a 45-minute presentation. So I'm aware that I had to leave out a lot of important works. But we'll start with a couple little tidbits here. Um, in the past, Vincent van Gogh painted his famous Starry Night in St. Remy, France in 1889. Now the Milky Way can no longer be seen from there. In the present, 80% of the population of the world has never even seen the Milky Way due to artificial light at night. So now I'm going to share with you some of the great things that have shaped who we are just by being in touch with our sky. Let's start with astronomy. Astronomy is one of the oldest natural sciences. Early civilizations and recorded history have made methodical observations of the night sky. These include the Babylonians, the Greeks, Indians, Egyptians, Chinese, Maya, and many ancient indigenous peoples of the Americas. In the past, astronomy included disciplines as diverse as astro astrometry, observational astronomy, and the making of calendars. Astrometry, one of the oldest, and is the science of positional astronomy, measures the location of a celestial object and its movement within the plane of the sky. This was one of the first techniques used to search for planets around other stars. Since humans have been able to record what they see, there have been maps of the constellations and the brightest stars. The earliest sky surveys were records of the positions and motions of stars and planets. People in ancient Egypt, China, Central America, and Mesopotamia conducted these surveys over 5,000 years ago. 
They recorded their data on stone tablets or temple walls and even built giant structures that aligned with specific astronomical events. The first known star catalog containing 800 stars was created in China in about 350 BC by Shi Shen. Early maps of the night sky include this tiny sliver of mammoth tusk with a carving of a man-like figure with arms and legs outstretched. He looks like he's in the same pose as the stars of Orion. The tablet was created by the Aragonian people of whom little is known. It's also one of the oldest known representations of a human. Uh, this was found in a cave in Ock Valley, Germany in 1979. And then we have um, discovered in 1940, the walls of the Lesu Caves. The caves show the artistic talents of our distant ancestors. The drawings may also demonstrate their scientific knowledge. And they could be a prehistoric planetarium in which humanity first char uh, charted the stars. Some other early mapping of the night sky. We have a ceiling of a Chinese tomb from the fourth to sixth century Northern Wei dynasty. Um, constellations as seen by ancient astronomers in China and a copy of a fourth century BC star map. Imagine trying to create these maps now. In suburbs, we can only see a handful of the brightest stars. Here are a couple more. We have a globe from Western India. This beautiful engraved hinged globe dates 1571 AD. It is inscribed brass with a nice example of early cartography. The Skiri Native Americans created this star chart on an antelope hide. That row of small dots across the middle represents the Milky Way, which they thought to be a path used by departing spirits. Um, that one was discovered in Oklahoma in 1906. The night sky was mapped with named constellations. A constellation is a group of stars that form an imaginary outline or pattern in the night sky, typically representing an animal, mythological person, or creature. There have been many versions naming the constellations over time. The names we are familiar with now come from ancient Greece. Other civilizations created their own patterns in the sky based on the stories and people that were important to them. For instance, these are the Dwar star maps of 1515, also called the Nuremberg sky. These are two celestial maps that are the oldest printed star charts published in Europe. They're woodcuts. They depict the northern and southern skies known to European astronomers at the time. And they show the stars with constellation figures as visualized by the Greeks and Romans. And you'll notice that most of the southern hemisphere, the map on the left side, is empty. They hadn't yet plotted that, or the Europeans hadn't yet plotted that sky. Another curious thing, a set of these woodcuts sold at a Sotheby's auction for 360,000 euros in 2011. Another set of constellations, we have the Atlas Calestis. It was published in 1729 based on observations made by the first astronomer royal, John Flamsteed. It is the largest atlas that has ever been published and the first comprehensive telescopic star catalog. It contains 26 maps of the major constellations visible from Greenwich, with drawings made in the Rococo style by James Thornhill. I've seen a lot of these as framed artwork in current day interiors. I think they're coming back into popularity. And we have these artworks um, by Ignace Gaston Parties. He was a French Jesuit and professor of mathematics in Paris. Um, these were created in the late 17th century. He corresponded with leading scientists of his day, including Newton, Leibniz, and Huygens. His plates joined together to make a unified view of the heavens as seen from the earth in the late 17th century. And not everyone in Europe was comfortable with using constellations based on pagan mythology. Published in the early 1600s, 
The Osberg lawyer Julius Schiller attempted to popularize the night sky by filling it with Christian images. He used the New Testament for the Northern Hemisphere, the Old Testament for the Southern Hemisphere, and the Twelve Apostles for the Zodiac. For example, Orion was named Saint Joseph. You see him in the left, lower left corner. In summary, constellations themselves are not uniformly defined across cultural groups. And since the positions of the stars change over time, the shape of constellations, do, they do as well. So the con constellations that our ancient ancestors saw in the night sky were likely different in appearance from the ones we know today. But they did play a very important role in navigation, legend, religion, um, they would use those shapes and images to tell stories. So we'll move to the, the Native American. Um, they had great stories attached to the stars. That would make a whole separate presentation, so I'm just going to share a few with you. I'll use the constellations we know the best. We have Orion. Um, our most common interpretation of Orion is the great hunter with a staff or a bow, but it is usually the three stars that make the belt the main focus in the Native American stories. So you can see that you've got the Omaha, they call it the goosefoot, the Apache, we'll call it the three vertebrae. The Inuits told that the three stars in the belt were hunters making snowshoe tracks. And the small cluster of stars called Pallades were actually their children carrying clothing to the hunter fathers. Our most common interpretation of Ursa Major is of a bear or the Big Dipper, as we may now call it. We've got um, the Shoshone calling it the Rabbit's Nut, uh, Wasco calling it the Wolf Brothers. The Anishinaabe tell a story of a fisher who went in search of squirrels to feed his family. While most drawings show a tail on the bear, many Native American stories say that the three stars of the tail are hunters chasing the bear. So it's pretty much been a creature in a lot of cultures. And we've got the North Star. Um, it's been called the Eye of the Creator by the Pomo. The Navajo call it the star on top. The Cree call it the guide of the people. The Paiute have a legend about the North Star. And they've got a really interesting story. It's Naga was a mountain sheep who loved to climb, which made his father very proud. One day he found a peak he thought he could not climb. After much effort, he found a hole in the mountain that led him to the top, but rocks rolled into the hole and trapped him onto the high peak. His father was very sad that his son could never return, so he made him into a star that didn't move so everyone could see it. The Milky Way was also, a, well, it is one of the most common sights in the night sky. It's got some interesting names too. The Pima call it flower and ash. The Lakota call it the spirit path. If you're in a dark location and the moonlight is not too bright, you can see the Milky Way. It's a faint band of light that stretches from horizon to horizon. It's actually the view of our galaxy from the side. The Desana of Columbia believed the Milky Way to be canoes filled with caterpillars descending to Earth on the east horizon, where the winds pick them up and carry them across the land. You know, um, the Zuni, it's the monster's entrails. The Maricopa call it the spider's web. It must have been a glorious sight back when and they could see it. There's no light. The few people today even acknowledge or know about these stars or patterns. And then we have the Aurora Borealis. It's a spectacular sight. We're seeing it all over the state right now. We're in a period of high solar activity. So auroras display dynamic patterns of brilliant lights that appear as curtains, rays, spirals, and dynamic flickers covering the entire sky. This would have been a great inspiration for stories. So you can see the Inuit spirits. They call it the spirits of the dead playing ball with a walrus skull. you got dancing humans and spirit animals. Torches used by giants to the north. The Macaw call it a tribe of dwarves, half the length of a canoe paddle that catches whales with their bare hands. In Canada and Northern Michigan, 
the Algonquin tribes believed the creator of the earth, Nana Bozo, moved to the far north and lit a huge fire. The aurora was a reflection of this fire, created to let his people know that even though he was far away, he was still thinking of them. And the Cree Indians believed the lights were a way of communicating with their ancestors. When dogs barked at the lights, it was because they recognized their lost companions. So let's move on into how the night sky played a, a really important role in navigation. Long before we had GPS, satellites, and even a simple clock, sailors learned to identify the stars in the sky so they could use them to navigate out of sight of land. The unimpeded view of the night sky was critical in early navigation. Imagine trying to navigate just by the night sky close to cities now. The North Star played an important role due to its consistent position in the sky. By measuring the angle between the northern horizon and the North Star, a navigator could accurately determine the ship's latitude. The first reliable seagoing clock wasn't even invented until the 1700s. Some early celestial navigation tools were the cross staff, the astrolabe, and eventually the quadrant, octant, and sextant. The primary use of the sextant is to measure the angle between the astronomical object and the horizon. One of the earlier ones was the cross staff or the Jacob staff, and it was used to determine angles, for instance, the angle between the horizon and Polaris or the sun to determine a vessel's latitude. In the astrolabe's importance comes from the early developments into the study of astronomy, but it is also effective for determining latitude on land or calm seas. And ancient sailors just watched constellations to mark their positions. Navigation in different cultures. The Inuits used stars for survival and navigation, especially when they went out on a hunt and needed to return safely home. Legends were created about the stars to help the younger generations learn and easily recognize their positions in the sky. Since Polaris was too high to be a guiding star in the Arctic, dog sledding teams would pick a star close to the horizon for direction on long trips. They would move in a direction to the left of the star to compensate for the passage of time and the movement of the star. When that star moved too far to the right, they'd pick another one close to where the original star was located. And we all know common or cloudy skies are common in the Arctic. If they didn't have the night sky, they would have to go by the wind direction and snow drifts. Um, and landmarks were often non-existent in low snowy landscapes. And for thousands of years, the First Nations people of Australia used the night sky for navigation. At gatherings, elders teach navigational tracks to younger clan members using the spatial relationships between certain stars in the night sky, with each star representing a specific natural landmark along the way. Clan members were taught how to navigate a voyage to a place they had never visited, sometimes even being taught star maps of the winter sky for a voyage in the summer. The voyagers had to remember the precise relative positions of the winter stars for a successful summer trip. And to help travelers remember those maps, First Nation clans preserved them in song. And we have archaeoastronomy. It's another way the ancient civilizations used that night sky for reference. The most public view of archaeoastronomy is the practice of alignment analysis, the study of the orientation of structures and calculating the direction in which they face. In the case of Stonehenge, it's well known to face the rising midsummer sun. Researchers have studied Stonehenge as well as several other stone formations across the UK, and they came to the conclusion that Stonehenge was likely built to track the movement of the sun, moon, and stars thousands of years ago. It has been long known that astronomy played a central role in the culture, religion, and daily lives of the Inca, who used astronomical events to govern ceremonial occasions and for planning agricultural activities. The city of Cuzco was constructed in such a way it would replicate the sky and point to specific astronomical bodies. 
Pleiades was one of the important constellations of, of the Incas who called it the seven kids after the seven brightest stars in the cluster. And the rising of Pleiades signaled the start of the Incan year. We have archaeoastronomy in Egypt. In 1993, Robert Balval, co-author of several books on the pyramids, noticed that the three main pyramids on the Giza Plateau were a mirror reflection of the three belt stars in the constellation Orion. It's a constellation really important to the Egyptians. His theory is that the three pyramids represent the three stars in the belt of Orion. The Sphinx corresponds to the constellation Leo, and the Nile corresponds to the Milky Way. The concept of creating a sacred landscape on Earth that reflects the night sky is not uncommon in other ancient cultures. You can find the same alignment of pyramids in China and Mexico. Archaeoastronomy in the United States includes effigy mounds and architecture. We have some great samples of these in our own backyard. Only a short drive from Michigan, we have the giant serpent mound. It's a 1,348 foot long, three foot high prehistoric effigy mound located in Peebles, Ohio. It's the largest effigy in the world, having been built around 1070 CE. Many archaeologists believe that the mound's creation could have been influenced by two different astronomical events. The light from the supernova that created the Crab Nebula in the year 1054 CE and the appearance of Halley's Comet in 1066 CE. It also sits on the edge of an ancient crater. It's been suggested that the curves in the body of the snake parallel lunar phases and align with two, the two solstices and the two equinoxes. If you get a chance, go down there. It's a really beautiful site. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, so it's, it's probably a five or six hour drive from Grand Rapids where I live. Um, we have the Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Many Chacoan buildings may have been aligned to capture the solar and lunar cycles, requiring generations of astronomical observations and centuries of skillfully coordinated construction. And we've got the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in Wyoming. It's one of four or five astronomically complex wheels that are publicly known to exist in the Rocky Mountain region. The larger complex wheels are capable of tracking several different cosmic cycles, including the precession of the equinoxes, the moon's phases, lunar and solar eclipse cycles, and the planet's orbital cycles. Imagine taking away the view of the night sky from these civilizations. They wouldn't have been able to create these. So we'll move on to artwork. And we're still going on about everything that the night sky has inspired throughout humanity. So long before photographic prints, the night sky was an inspiration for artists of all mediums. It was one of the few ways to illustrate what was actually being seen in the sky. These prints from the comet book or the book of miracles are from the 16th century. As the title suggests, the focus is on the meaning of comets and the associated folklore and superstition is played out on earth as opposed to an exploration from a scientific standpoint. The telescope would not be invented till the following century. Comets were then believed to be superstitious and predicted a catastrophic event. Nevertheless, these are beautiful drawings of comets that would have been seen back then. This is my favorite artist from the 1800s, the French artist, astronomer, and amateur entomologist, Etienne Leopold Traveleau. He created 7,000 or so illustrations from his astronomical observations, the quality of which reached their zenith in 15 exquisite pastel works, which were published as the Trovolo Astronomical Drawings in 1882. He would dismiss photography of the heavens as so blurred and indistinct that no details of any great value could be secured. By illustrating instead what he saw through telescopes, he secured a place in art and science history. The Trovolo illustrations are beautiful and they're in the public domain as artworks that you can download and print. Other works of art from paintings and sketches from the 19th century. Well, of course, I had to include another Trovolo here with the Great Comet of 1881. 
We've got Starry Night by Jean-Francois Millet, 1850. In Lapland by Carl Svante Halfback, 1856. You can see the aurora back there behind that mountain. Do a few more here. Um, we've got the fantastic mountainous landscape with a starry sky by Robert Caney. It was done in the late 1800s. And we have woodblock prints and sketches. We've got one from the William Mackenzie Encyclopedia of the Aurora Borealis at the top and a colored wood engraving by Charles Wimper. You know, art can be used to communicate ideas and thoughts, even as a means to find beauty in life. And that would have been the only way they could have recorded one of the only ways, the night sky. But there are more. Two years after a naked eye comet pierced the blanket of night in the spring of 1874, Ellen Harding Baker began a near decade long project to bring the stars further down to earth. An oblique quilt depicting the solar system, complete with a green tailed comet with its slingshot course plotted around the sun. Working as an astronomy teacher in Lone Tree, Iowa, Ellen Harding Baker quilted this representation of the cosmos for her students. And of course, we got music and poetry. Several songs and compositions have been created about the night sky. One that has remained popular through the years is Beautiful Dreamer. It's a parlor song by American songwriter Stephen Foster. And it was published in March 1864. We might know it from Roy Orbison or the Beatles, and it has been used in many films. And be careful humming this one. It can be an earworm. We have Holtz's monumental masterpiece, The Planets. It was written between 1914 and 1916, and 15 years before Pluto was discovered. Its seven movements take listeners on an epic journey around the solar system with eerie and ominous tones. And poetry is yet another popular form of telling about the night sky. They look at the stars, look up at the skies, oh, look at the fire folks sitting in the air. You most definitely will not see all of those fire folks sitting in the air today. Some other well-known poems, William Shakespeare, Sonnet 14, you got John Keats, Bright Star, Emily Dickinson, Ah, Moon and Star. There are many. Look at this amaz amazing stage set for the Magic Flute. This was an opera that was done in 1791 in Vienna. Mozart conducted the orchestra, and the role of Queen of the Night was sung by Mozart's sister-in-law, Josepha Hofer. Although it portrays the night as evil and the day as good, the night and the stars are a focus of this opera. It goes something like this. The Tratorius Monsados appears with the Queen of the Night and her three ladies. They plot to destroy the temple, and the Queen confirms she has promised her daughter to Monsados. But before the conspirators can enter enter the temple, they are magically cast out into eternal night. I would love to go to a show that had that stage set. So there are many myths, legends, and stories about the night sky in print. Of course, we can't cover that here in a 45 minute presentation. So I thought I'd just share some great books that I have on my shelf. Um, Depends on your preference of nonfiction, educational reference, or full-on mythology. Um, but as creative as they were, I look at many of these stories as history. The tales were told for the purpose of teaching generations about their heritage or to aid in using the night sky for navigation. You can find great books on all the subjects we have in this presentation. And I can put the, the list of, of these in the chat when the presentation is done. The natural night sky is our common and universal heritage, yet it's rapidly becoming unknown to the newest generations. The history of scientific discovery and even human curiosity itself is indebted to that natural night sky. Experiencing the night sky provides perspective, inspiration, and it leads us to reflect on our humanity and place in the universe. I hope that I've been able to impress upon you some of the great things that night sky has inspired throughout history. So we have current day, 
Let's move on to current day stargazing. Let's talk about how you can get inspired in this century. Just get out there and become acquainted with your night sky. Head out of town and to observe the natural beauty of the stars. If you can't get out of town, um, a lot of the cities will have local planetariums where you can still enjoy the views. Join a, a local observatory and learn about astronomy. There are star parties all over the state where you can look through telescopes and learn. They're open to the public. Visit a dark sky place. We have several in Michigan, which we'll go over in a minute. Try sleeping under the stars. Find campgrounds in less populated areas. Try it in your own backyard. There's nothing more magical than falling asleep under the stars. Take on a new hobby. Learn astrophotography or night photography. You can become a citizen scientist for Globe at Night, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, you can attend dark sky events. Meteor showers always create night sky events at state parks and dark sky places. And look up trips where the night sky is the focus. Astro tourism is becoming a trend. It's so easy right now to find night sky related trips all over the country and the world. But first you gotta find the night sky. For three billion years, life on Earth existed in a rhythm of light and dark that was created solely by the illumination of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now artificial light overpowers the darkness and our cities glow at night. You might have to drive a long way to get a great view of the night sky, but Michigan still has many areas that are dark enough for, for stargazing. We have three international dark sky parks and six dark sky preserves. Um, the dark sky, international dark sky parks were designated by the International Dark Sky Association. Um, they had to go through a lot of testing and application process to prove that their skies were dark enough. And the, there we have six dark sky preserves dedicated by the state of Michigan state legislature. So I've listed them up here. Um, you can also find these on the, the Michigan DNR website. Um, usually they'll have events listed too that are going on at these parks. So a dark sky park or preserve is a place where there is low or no light pollution, good air quality, and a distinguished quality of starry nights. We have several other places in the state where the skies are dark. We got Beaver Island, Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, Whitefish Point, Quamina Falls, uh, most places on Lake Superior, um, especially looking north, if you want to catch those northern lights. And our dark sky programs are really um, coming along at the state parks. We have a lot of snowshoeing at night, uh, stargazing parties happening at local observatories. So there's always something going on in our state if you want to get out and reacquaint yourself with the night sky. Another way to connect with night skies to capture it yourself. Take on a new hobby. A night photography is a great way to be out under the stars. You don't need special equipment to get basic nightscapes. Pictures of the Milky Way, the moon. Um, you can get out year round. There's always something of interest to photograph. We have Orion in the winter when the sky is crisp and clear. We have auroras in October and March. Celestial events are always happening like meteor showers and eclipses. And right now our auroras are flaring. So we have a group, if, if you're interested in getting out to see an Aurora or even photograph one, you might think about joining the Michigan Aurora Chasers. They got over 50,000 people um, and they're always going out after the Aurora when we get the solar flare announcements. Now um, you can become a citizen scientist. More than 200,000 measurements have been contributed from people in 180 countries over the last 14 years, making Globe at Night the most successful light pollution awareness campaign to date. There is an astonishing amount of data from Globe at Night supplied by citizen scientists from around the world who sampled their local sky brightness from 2011 to 2022. All you need is a computer or a smartphone and you can just step out on your back deck. They do want those measurements coming from wherever you're at, not just the dark areas. Europe saw a 6.5% increase in light pollution per year, while North America saw a 10.4% increase. 
over that period of time from 2011 to 2022. And researchers found that globally light pollution increased by 9.6% per year over that time period. Now, to get out there and view the night sky, we have a lot of apps that can help you. Um, there's some great apps. Sky Guide is one of the main ones I use. You can click on any star. It'll give you information about that star, that constellation. It shows the rockets going by, satellites. It used to show the satellites. I think there's too many going up in the air now for it to keep up with it. But you can find the International Space Station and constellations. You can change the time and date. You can look forward and plan. So if you wanted to see where the core of the Milky Way is going to be at 11 o'clock tomorrow night, um, you can just plug all that in and it'll, it'll tell you. Another favorite of mine is the moon. This app lets you know the setting and rising times of the moon, the waxing and waning, and when the new moon is due, which is real important if you're going to get out and photograph the night sky. You can see when the new moon is due. So you can see here the second week of June back in 21 would have been a great night to get out when it was absolutely dark. Astrospheric, this is a great app for finding clouds and weather conditions. It's um, used by astronomers and astrophotographers in North America. It shows the dew point, which is really good. You know your uh, lens won't fog up or you know to bring your lens warmers. I do night photography, so I probably, that's why I'm referencing uh, photography quite a bit here. And then light pollution map. It shows light pollution in your area and helps you to find darker areas to stargaze or photograph. So you can see here that the lower part of our state is just covered in light, but our UP still has a lot of dark areas. But you can know if you're if you want to see the Milky Way, you've got to look south. So really, there's nowhere good in Michigan unless you get way up north. But if you want to see the northern lights, you've got a lot of great areas looking north. And of course, any weather app that shows cloud cover. Um, we on my side of the state, Lake Michigan's always throw, throwing clouds at us, so it helps to show what's coming over the lake. And we have the Aurora app. This one will give you the KP index, map of the best view, your viewing probability, and your cloud cover. Um, so this one's really good, and there's several out there for Aurora chasing. And then my favorite is photo pills. This one, whether or not you're a photographer, it's a really powerful app to tell you where the Milky Way core is going to be, where the Milky Way will be over your head, exactly where that moon's going to rise and set and the sun's going to rise and set. You can plot uh, the pin where you're going to be, the red pin in the middle, and you can put another pin out to the direction you want to look. So you could get the moon rising under a bridge. You can plan all of that in advance. Um, so it's a really powerful app, and you can see down here on the bottom, it'll tell you when true night is, it'll give you the twilights, and you can also put a calendar in, say you're going to be in Ireland in 2024 in April, and you can plot out where the view of the Milky Way and the everything will be ahead of time. Okay, um, we're going to talk about why we're losing our night skies. Um, it's a really sad, I've already covered our heritage of the night sky. Let's talk about some of the ways light pollution affects us in the environment. Less than 100 years ago, everyone could look up and see a spectacular starry night sky. Now millions of children across, across the globe will never experience the Milky Way where they live. The increased and widespread use of artificial light at night is not only impairing our view of the universe, it's affecting our environment, our safety, our energy consumption and our health. So we'll briefly go over some of these. So energy and money, what does light pollution cost? About $3 billion per year of energy is lost to bad lighting. Poorly designed outdoor lighting wastes energy by not being shielded, by emitting more light than necessary or shining when and where it's not needed. Wasting energy in this way has huge economic and environmental consequences. 
In the U.S. alone, about 15 million tons of CO2 are emitted each year to power just residential outdoor lighting. It affects our wildlife and our ecosystems. Declining insect populations negatively impact all species that rely on insects for food or pollination, being drawn to artificial light messes with their natural mating cycles. Nocturnal mammals sleep in the day and are active at night. Light pollution disrupts their nighttime environment and migration habits. Glare from artificial lights can also impact wetland habitats that are home to amphibians, such as frogs and toads. Their nighttime croaking is part of the breeding ritual, interfering with reproduction and reducing populations. We've all heard about the sea turtles being affected by artificial light. Artificial lights can disrupt the migratory schedules of birds, causing them to leave too early or too late in the season, missing ideal conditions for nesting. There are full-time jobs in some cities that hire people just to clean up and dispose of dead and injured birds that accidentally fly into the windows of high-rise buildings. And we have lighting has how it involved, is involved with crime and safety. Bad outdoor lighting can actually reduce safety. A study by the city of Chicago actually found a correlation between increased crime and brightly lit alleyways. Look at this example. You've got a guy standing in a doorway. So glare from that bright unshielded light, actually you won't be able to see him. See how the glare in the bottom photo makes it hard to see the man at the gate? It shines into your eyes, constricting your pupils. This diminishes your ability to adapt to low light conditions. Poorly designed lighting on roadways and highways contributes to tragic accidents. Motorists and pedestrians can temp be temporarily blinded by glare from unshielded street lights and electronic signs. And we won't even go there on the bright car headlights that are on all the new vehicles. And it affects human health. Our biological clocks are important. They interact with our body systems, changing our hormone levels and even modifying our genetic code. Natural light helps set our clocks to Earth's 24 hour day night cycle. Blue rich light at night is particularly harmful. Most LEDs used for outdoor lighting, computer screens, TVs, and other electronic displays emit abundant blue light. It affects our sleep patterns and increases our risks for cancer and other potentially dead diseases. The good news is light pollution is reversible. Cities are now starting to step up with programs that reduce the amount of artificial light. They're shielding their lights and bringing down the color temperature. We don't need to light the sky. There's no reason for it. Lighting the ground is all that's needed to get around in urban areas. In the bottom left, you can see a picture of Flagstaff, Arizona. It's an example of how you can bring back the sky. When they implemented some of these changes, you can now see the stars above the city. It's a very simple thing to do. You just shield the lights so they only illuminate the ground instead of, instead of the sky. You use LEDs that are warmer in color, 3000K or lower. And unnecessary indoor lighting, particularly in empty office buildings at night, this should be turned off. It's, it's, it's not a hard thing to do. We just got to get people um, knowing about what they can do to help. Now, how can you help? You can be informed. Darksky.org is the home website for the International Dark Sky Association. You can learn about what's going on all over the world, all of the cities that are working on bringing their lights down to where they should be. You can be informed locally, darkskymichigan.org. Um, you can learn about sky preservation projects going on near you. We've got them all over the state. At home, you can shield your lights and use warmer lighting. Use motion detection lights at night to save energy and install lighting only when and where it is needed. And get involved with your township. If you see new construction projects going on, um, if you hear that they're gonna be changing out their lighting system, get involved. Good lighting policies are really important. And just get out there and reconnect with the night sky. It's part of all of our heritage and humanity. So final thought. We'll say again, Van Gogh painted his famous starry night in St. Remy, France in 1889. Now the Milky Way can no longer be seen from there. If he were alive today, do you think he'd still be inspired to paint his starry night paintings? And that's it.
So we'll open up to any questions. If anyone has a question for Robin, you can uh, either use the chat or the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, it looks like we do have a question already. Um, Lynn asks, if you wanted a dark sky night in a bit of a hurry off from Troy, where would you recommend driving? Um, well, your darkest uh, position looking north would be up into the thumb. We've got Port Crescent State Park. It's a dark sky preserve. And you've got a lot of um, dark sky preserves up the east coast of Michigan, Rockport State Park. Um, right now, the aurora has been flaring so well, I think you just get away from the city about a half an hour. You could probably see some northern lights. Is there any state or federal legislation that attempts to combat light pollution that we could follow? Um, I would just recommend signing up or following um, the International Dark Sky Association and our new chapter. That's what we're here for. We're already working with the city of Grand Rapids, not with the city, but with the citizens that are concerned. So we're just getting started in the state um, to try to work on, on some of these. We've got uh, conservation projects, a lot of them going on in the UP as well. There's, so we're going to have a lot of dark sky places. Uh, someone's added a comment. Um, I have been at Lake Superior at night and it is amazing. I've also been to the night sky park in Mackinac City. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the headlands. Now, um, dark sky parks are great. Just keep in mind, if you're going up as a photographer and you want to go to a dark sky park, the light pollution is measured straight up. So you might not get the perfect view on the horizon of no light pollution but you can look straight up and get some really dark skies. How can I tell if we are seeing a slight aurora? Um, that's hard to do with the naked eye. They usually appear white or gray on the horizon. Um, if you've got a phone, phones are picking them up. Um, try to do a long exposure with your phone, two to four minutes. It'll kind of just show you if it's there. And the really big ones that we've had in the last two nights, you can see them with the naked eye. And Grace asks, how long will the northern lights be around this time? Well, right now we're in a heavy, heavy solar flare. So our so assist, uh, well, I'm tongue tied, I've talked for 45 minutes. Um, we've got a three to five year window here where we're going to get a lot of solar activity and ebbs and flows. And we'll go through another five to seven year period where we won't see any. So um, some of the apps that I suggested, the Aurora app, you can actually set up notifications and it'll tell you the likelihood of seeing the Aurora anywhere in the state. And if you join that group on Facebook, Michigan Aurora Chasers, you'll, you'll hear about every little solar flare. Okay, any further questions? I think that was all of them that I see. So I think we are good on the questions. Thank you so much, Robin, for joining us. It was really an interesting presentation. Um, and again, thank you to our friends for sponsoring this and for all of you for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.